introducing myself a bit. Uh, my, uh, I've been married to my wife Nancy now for 16 years, and we actually grew up uh, a few miles down the road in Park Ridge, Illinois, and Niles, Illinois. Uh, so we're from here. We've got two uh, girls, uh, Abby and Livy. I think here's a picture of them. Uh, Abby's 10 and Livy's 8, and they still love school. This is their first day of school uh, just a week ago. Uh, after my family, uh, I want to introduce what takes up most of my time, which is Urbana, the Urbana Student Missions Conference. It's the largest student missions conference in the world. Every three years, we have about 16 to 20,000 students come. Uh, since 1946, we've been going. And Billy Graham often shares that half of the missionaries in the world were likely called to the mission field at an Urbana conference. It's a dedicated place for you to hear God's will for your life. Uh, it's also a five-day experience where you hear majority world voices, world-class speakers, it's over 200 different seminars, uh, general sessions that integrate the arts, theater, and multi-ethnic worship. Uh, over 250 mission organizations and seminaries are there as well. Um, uh, we'll have uh, morning Bible studies, interactive labs. We're going to have our first ever hackathon at this. Uh, there you go. 500. Uh, we'll have a hackathon that we're expecting about 500 students at, so we're very excited about that. More online at urbana.org. Now, one of the things you should also know about me is that growing up, I never dreamed of being a missionary. Uh, I never thought I looked like a missionary. Uh, in my home, the one thing I was never taught was to be a missionary. I was taught that missionaries were strange people with nothing better to do with their lives. I was taught that missionaries were for only the super spiritual, you know, the superhero Christian. I was taught to be a good student instead, to, to pursue the American dream, a white picket fence home with 2.5 cars and 2.5 kids. My parents came from poverty in Asia, so I wouldn't have to live in poverty in Asia. I was taught to be like the rich young ruler in Mark chapter 10. He's the guy who goes up to Jesus to make sure that he has the basics of his spiritual life covered. And I think he's the kind of guy that our parents would really be proud of. He's a child prodigy, maybe the top of his class at the University of Galilee, CEO of a startup company made with hundreds of millions of dollars of stock options, a good moral guy too. I mean, he obeyed most of the commandments. He, he was very good to his parents, took care of the elderly, gave to the local temple. He's the kind of guy that I think our parents would say, why can't you be more like him? You know? Or maybe uh, for some of us here, the kind of guy that our parents would say, why can't you marry someone like him? But there's one thing that this guy's missing, this guy who seemingly had it all. And we're going to look at the story in Mark chapter 10 that's not your typical mission story this morning. I think many of you have heard about missions or you know something about it, You've, you can access information about it. So we're going to do a heart check this morning. We're going to look at and focus on our heart for missions. So let's look at Mark chapter 10 together. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to it. Uh, we'll also look at some of the text here on the screen. Mark chapter 10. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. What must I do to inherit eternal life? This young leader here wants a to-do checklist, right? Jesus, just tell me what I need to do to cross the line. And then, you know, tell me what I don't really need to worry about. You know, the extra credit stuff? You know, isn't missions like extra credit, right? So Jesus says, well, you're a smart guy. You know the commandments. You know Exodus 20. Now, if you look at these commandments, what's odd about these commandments? Look at verse 19 again. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. How many are there here? Six here, right? There's six up here. Right? Why these six? These are commandments that deal with our relationships with others. The commandments we normally think of when we say, well, I'm a good family-oriented you know, hard-working, church-going person, so I can go to heaven. And you kind of get the feeling that this rich young student is thinking the same thing. He says, teacher, all these I have done since I was a boy. Gives himself a little pat on the back. Good job. 
What's missing, though? What are the other four commandments about? They deal with our relationship with God. So Jesus calls this guy to do something really hard. Right? What does he say in verse 21? Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. He's shocked. He leaves in tears because his identity has been rooted in his wealth. If we're to follow Jesus into his mission in the world, it's important for us to remember that Jesus doesn't give us easy calling. Jesus is saying in Mark chapter 10 that his mission can be costly at times. And as I travel to different campuses across the country or even internationally, there are three categories of wealth or idols that we most often wrestle with, no matter what university I'm at. Areas which are difficult for many prospective missionaries around the world to go, sell, and leave behind. The first I want to look at this morning is selling and leaving future wealth. This future wealth might be career or it might be money. Can everyone here say money? Money, right? Some of you said that with a lot of excitement. Uh, I was raised not to worship God, but to, raise, to worship the straight-A report card or a certain type of career that can only be described as full-time professional positions with unlimited financial potential. Okay. So any of you grew up hearing that too? No? Uh, and if I couldn't do that, I had to at least go to graduate school uh, to get some letters after my name, you know, like MD, JD, PhD. And I was doing pretty well on this track. I gradu when I graduated high school, I was like the rich young student. Graduated top of my class at Maine South High School, just a few miles from here, uh, top of the state in the state of Illinois. I was on the cover of magazines on an ESPN television special. Parents would say to their kids, hey, you see that guy Tom there? Why can't you be like... Tom, you know. And mothers would say to their daughters, hey, you see that guy Tom there? Why can't you marry someone like Tom, right? And then I uh, became a student at Harvard University and came in for my multi-million dollar professional career. I shaped my identity around it. I needed to study all the time to get all A's, to graduate valedictorian, to go to Harvard Law School, to get those JD letters after my name to make my millions. And I chased that dream until one day, when it was finally within reach, I felt empty. There's something inside of me that was saying, there's one thing missing. That day I met Jesus through a Bible study in Mark chapter 10. And Jesus said, I have a mission for you, Tom. Go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and then you'll have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. It meant making a decision to turn down six-figure jobs to follow Jesus' call to be a campus missionary within a varsity, a job with virtually no security, no financial potential, and no letters after my name. It meant watching my classmates have careers that only my parents would dream of, and here I was doing this missions thing. And so soon, parents started saying to their kids, now you see that guy Tom there? Don't ever be like him. Her mother started saying to the daughters, you see that guy over there? Don't even think about marrying him. I cried out to God, if you're calling me to missions, why won't you make it easier? Now to be clear, this is not to say that the only career that's viable is a full-time vocational ministry career. In fact, if you've ever been to a pastor's conference or have heard of them, you see pastors who struggle with idolizing their own ministry careers. Our careers can suddenly become wealth that feels impossible to leave behind. How might God be calling us to go and sell future wealth for the sake of reaching the nations? The second area of cost uh, for many around the world is relational wealth. Relational wealth. Specifically, relationships with families. Can everyone here say family? Family, yeah. This is happening all around the world, the cost of leaving family. Probably the hardest relationship I've ever had to leave behind to follow Jesus in mission has been my relationship with my parents. And the first thing I want to say is I love my mom and dad dearly, my children. I cannot think of anything I would not do for them. But sometimes Jesus says, in order to come and follow me, 
It's going to inconvenience your family, your parents, your children. When I first responded to God's call in my 20s, mom and dad argued profusely with me for days and days and days. And finally, they got down on their knees and they had their palms open. They said, Tom, if you do this missions thing, you'll crush us. Please don't crush us. They said, our lives are in the palm of your hands, Tom. And finally, mom ended all the arguing by saying, Tom, if you do this, I will kill myself. They cut off communication for years. My phone calls went unanswered, my letters unreturned. They went into severe depression. They stopped going to church for years. And seven years later, my mom was diagnosed with stage four cancer, and we still had not reconciled. I cried out to God, if you're calling me to missions, why won't you make it easier? It's hard following Jesus into missions sometimes. Fast forward a few years later, I was serving as a campus minister and close to going outside, outside of the U.S. Uh, while dating uh, Nancy, uh, one of the days Nancy asked me, Tom, would you ever consider going overseas? And I directly answered her right away. I said, no, I love Americans and I love America. Why would I go? Uh, little did I know that was her marriage interview question and I had failed it. Uh, God gradually uh, changed my heart uh, by using Nancy and by using the scriptures. Uh, as I looked at the word, I began to see that from Genesis to Revelations, our God is a missionary God. I began to realize all the blessings I had obtained in my life, all the honors, the accolades, my education, the riches were all for a grander purpose, to bless the nations. And then at Urbana 2000, God captured me with a vision for the world, something I would give my life for. And I responded, yes, Lord, whatever role I can have in your global mission, I'll do it. So we went on short-term opportunities to Vietnam, to Laos, Malaysia, Brunei, Cambodia. We began researching long-term opportunities. And finally, the Lord led us to Mongolia to go and sell, to pioneer an evangelical student movement there. And ironically, we found ourselves living in poverty and in Asia. And here's a picture of us here. So my wife, Nancy, on the right is my oldest daughter, who was a baby in Mongolia. And that's not our horse, but looks great in the picture. Okay. <laughs> now, it was a scary task. Mongolia is a former communist country where in 1989 there were zero known Christians. It's a country without Christian history, where the first Bible was translated in the year 2000. It's a country which most people refer to as the middle of nowhere. It's a country that was in extreme poverty at the time. The average income was about $40 or less a month. There are 3 million people in the country, and there are 33 million herded animals. And besides all that, it was cold. Negative 40 degrees in the winters. And the winters were seven months long. And at the time, we were living in California. So we thought, can we actually survive, God? Now, this brings me to a third category of cost in following God's call to missions. The third thing that ruled me, and that is pride, my pride. I wanted to be someone that was known or remembered, not someone that was unknown and forgotten. I didn't want to go to a place where I was utterly dependent on God, where I would be utterly humble. So when God said go, I said no. I said, I don't know that language. I'm terrible at learning languages. I don't like to be embarrassed. And frankly, I'm scared. But God said, go. Leave behind your English, and your preaching will be useless. I said, God, I'm a, I'm a city boy from Chicago. I can't rough it. I've been pampered all my life. I don't know the slightest thing about the countryside, about the outdoors. Send someone else. But God said, go. I said, God, we're, we're too young. You know, we need more training. We need more training. But God said, go. So we said, God, we're, we're too old. You know, send someone younger. <laughs> send some young college students. But God said, go. We left the pride we had in our friendships. We starting over was so hard. Some days, Nancy and I would just turn to each other and we'd say, honey, we have no friends. Then after serving in Mongolia for four years, we said, Lord, 
we're humbled enough. Thank you very much. Our mission's over. We're done. So we began to pray for our new mission. We became burdened for the growing number of unchurched in America, refugees, international students coming to the U.S. So we dreamed of coming back to California. You know, we're dreaming of the good Asian food we had missed, you know. We dreamed of maybe Boston. We had lived in Boston for some time. But as we prayed, the only image God gave us was this, Missouri and Kansas. Okay. And um, we eventually, as we moved to Missouri, we finally called this area the Mongolia of the U.S. Okay. I remember one of my class, seminary classmates said, Tom, this is so interesting. You're leaving Mongolia, and you're going to the most unsexy ministry context I can think of. Right? And in Missouri, we were forgotten. We were humbled all over again, some of the hardest years of our lives. But God doesn't call us to be remembered or to be known by the world. God doesn't give us calls to sexy ministry. God doesn't give us easy calls to me, to the rich young ruler, or to Trinity students. Go and sell everything, then come follow me. Where is your Mongolia? Where is that unreached people group, that unsexy place that Jesus may be calling you to? Where is that place of utter dependence on the Lord? I want to conclude with the ending of the Mark chapter 10 passage and a phrase we can easily miss. This has transformed the way I look at God's mission. If you look at verse 21, it says, Jesus looked at him and loved him. Jesus loves him. Jesus doesn't want to be mean to this guy. And so I ask myself, if leaving this one thing behind is so painful and hard, how is this out of love? Peter has the same question in verse 28. He says, Jesus, look, I've left everything and followed you. What about me? And Jesus answers in verse 29 and 30. I tell you the truth. No one who has left homes or brothers or sister or mother or father or children or feels for me in the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age, homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, and with them persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. God is faithful. Amen? Jesus essentially says, I know it's going to be hard, but it's going to be so good. Your investment in my global mission as hard as it is, will result in more blessing. And in my life, as I've left certain things behind to follow Jesus, Jesus has given blessing a hundredfold. A hundredfold in our faith. We got to see miracle after miracle after miracle in Mongolia and the U.S. In our four years there, we pioneered the Mongolian Fellowship of Christian Students, a movement that's now registered with the government, reaching universities throughout Mongolia. Over 500 students have come to faith through the ministry, and there are six indigenous Mongolians that lead the ministry. And here's a picture of some of the 500 students that came to faith. We've received a hundredfold in our relationships with my spouse, with Nancy, my marriage, my children. My children were never sick in Mongolia. You know when they got sick? When we came back to the U.S. Right? Uh, a hundredfold in parental relationships. Uh, churches, surrogate parents from around the country rallied around us. And then a few months before my mom passed away, we received a hundredfold again. Uh, my mom had invited me home uh, and motioned over to the sofa where she was sitting. And as I sat down next to her, she held my hand. And tears started coming down her face. And she said, Tom, there's something I've been wanting to say to you for a long, long time now. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry, Tom. I should have supported you all those years. Will you forgive me? Those are words that I've been yearning to hear for well over seven years from my mom. And she finally gave it to me before she passed. God is good. Amen. It's hard following Jesus and giving your life to God's global mission. But it's so worth it. Where is your Mongolia? For some of you, the next step might be to go short term. 
as you're considering. One to two weeks, one to two months. Investing a short time in seeing God's heart for the nations. There are lots of short-term opportunities that can match your college major or your interests. And as a missionary family with kids, we love people who just came short-term just to babysit. Someone to just say, hey, Tom, do you need a babysitter? What a gift. Many of you have a couple of months of vacation during the summers, right? Take a, I often say, take a vacation that will bless the nations instead of going somewhere boring like Hawaii or something. You know? <laughs> or go and get a five-day taste during your winter break by coming to Urbana 15 this winter. Invest a short time in researching opportunities, meeting thousands of missionaries, and finding God's will for your life. Now, for some of you, God may be inviting you to consider committing long-term. For some of you, your Mongolia might be the unprecedented refugee crisis in Syria and the Middle East. Or your Mongolia might be the unreached people groups in South Asia, where there are more than 40 groups of greater than 100,000 in population completely unengaged with the gospel. There is no church in those populations, mostly Hindu and Muslim groups. Or your Mongolia might be one of 2,000 language groups in the world without the word of God. Bible is people groups. You can go as a linguist, a project manager, an IT professional to help with infrastructure needs. And for some of us eager to cross the oceans, your Mongolia might actually be crossing the street of your own neighborhood and reaching the world that has come to us. Uh, I love this quote by Pastor J.D. Payne. He says, something is missionally malignant if we make sacrifices to travel the world to reach people but are unwilling to cross the street. It might not be clear right now what your role might be, how your current studies fit in, but his invitation is clear. He wants you to go and sell, to follow Jesus to the nations. Will you say yes to going to your Mongolia, to going to the nations? Let me pray for us. Lord, we thank you for your word, for your call in our lives to follow you, Lord, and it is so worth it. Whatever uh, area of our lives that seem difficult to leave behind, to go and sell, Lord, we declare that it's worth it. It's worth it, Lord. And we thank you for your faithfulness and your promises to give a hundredfold and more, Lord. And so, Lord, as we leave this place, Lord, would you impress this question on our hearts? What are our, our Mongolias? What are those places? of utter dependence on you that we may need to leave behind and go to, Lord. Lord, would you lead us to a short-term opportunity? Would you lead us to an encounter with a mentor or a missionary? Lord, would you guide us in our next steps toward following you into your mission in the world? We pray all this in Jesus' name.